Without further ado, welcome back for the afternoon. Welcome back. Our next speaker is Jeanette Favreau Peterson, who is a research professor in the Department of History and Art in, of Art and Architecture at University of California, Santa Barbara. Her teaching and research have focused in the field of pre-Columbian and colonial Latin America visual culture. She is the author of the Paradise Gardens of Malinalco. Her long-standing interest in the intersection of European and indigenous visual cultures has led, numer has led to numerous articles on the Florentine Codex. Jeanette Peterson will, present us, will be presenting European models transformed in Book 12 from the Old Testament to Olao Magnus's Historia. It's always so wonderful to be a part of a conference that's as focused as this one is because the presentations, the talks begin to intersect in very interesting ways. So uh, this morning's rich inventory of papers and ideas, I think, offer a good foundation for some of my comments. Book 12's bountiful images of the Spanish conquest in the Florentine Codex have long been dismissed as decorative and derivative, somehow corrupted for their reliance on imported sources. The mostly black and white paintings in watercolor and pen and ink were executed in the final stages of the Florentine's production, 20 years after the Nahuatl text was recorded in 1555. In spite of the Europeanized style and iconography of the 161 images, they capture the graphic, often violent, immediacy of the narrative. The indigenous team collaborating with Bernardino de Sahagún had access to a well-endowed library in the Colegio de Santa Cruz of Santiago Tlatelolco. A substantial remnant, some 373 books, survive rather miraculously and are housed in the Sutro Library of San Francisco State. And here are three of the sellos I have found on these books. Two feature Santiago, one on horseback, here's Santiago. Another one's a very interesting anagram of Tlatelolco. See if you can figure it out. Although the, mostly, uh, although the most abundantly illustrated volumes had disappeared, they were either stolen or sold, before 1889, when the German industrialist and bibliophile Adolf Sutro purchased the collection in Mexico and brought it to the United States, engraved images can be found in unlikely places. The Nahua scribe painters, or Tlacuiloque, scavenged for visual models among the diverse publications on the bookshelves. From these, we can track how, and most importantly, why, the artists borrowed certain pictorial motifs, whole cloth or piecemeal. The process of selecting visual sources reveals the intentional choices and independence of Sahagun's artistic team. Here we see one of the most violent images in Book 12, depicting the Spaniards, their allies, and horses drowning in a canal as they tried to flee Tenochtitlan during the Noche Triste. And you see it on the left. The maelstrom of body parts and rearing horses is analogous somewhat in its design to a biblical illustration of the conversion of Saul in the Old Testament, which you see on the right. However, the Florentine painters relied on the engraved sources not solely as pictorial solutions to artistic problems. 
They were keenly aware of the linguistic and historic context in which these images are embedded. Although we will see that their images can echo Euro-Christian themes and designs, the Tlaquiloque constructed alternative narratives that respond to their identity as Mexica, and more specifically, reveal a Tlatelolcan perspective. These different discourses are brought into contact in Book 12. Among the Florentines' more important sources, the work of Olaus Magnus had a powerful impact. A Catholic archbishop, writer, and diplomat, Olaus Magnus authored the description of the northern or Nordic peoples. Hereafter, I will refer to it as the Historia. He and his brother Johannes were exiled from Sweden after Lutheranism became the preeminent Protestant sect, living out their lives in some of the major capitals of Europe. Both wrote extensively about their Scandinavian homeland with the goal of glorifying their Nordic heritage. Immensely popular, the Historia was published in four languages and at least 20 editions before 1650. The Tlatelolco Library boasted two editions, one published in 1555 in Rome and the other in 1567 in Basel. My initial reaction was to ask, what could a 16th century Swedish historian possibly tell us about a Mexican manuscript? As it turns out, a great deal. And I'd like to credit Pablo Escalante and Victoria Rios for first pointing me to this important source. To begin with, the Historia of Olas Magnus offers surprising parallels with the conceptual organization and intent of Sahagun's project. In its encyclopedic coverage, the Historia also moves from the cosmic through the human to the animal realm. While Magnus does not give as fulsome a coverage to religion as does the Florentine Codex, his books devoted to warfare would be useful to the painters of Book 12. Magnus's fervent war against the heretical Lutheran movement, which he sought to return to the true faith of Catholicism, must have resonated with Sahagun's evangelistic goals. But what surely attracted the indigenous artists to the Magnus Historia are the profuse woodcuts that animate its pages. There are some 479 in the 1555 edition. Olas Magnus defended images as powerful didactic tools and was proud of the, what he called, variety and diversity of his illustrations. In order to visualize the conquest narrative, the Tlaquiloque had to find innovative solutions as they lacked precedence in their own pictorial uh, vocabulary. Traditionally, Aztec style renderings of warfare and conquest featured two stylized combatants or a single warrior with a captive, as you see here. Ideograms could also express warfare, such as a shield and a cluster of spears, or a burning temple. These were reductive images set against a neutral background. By contrast, the scenic views in Book 12 are multifigural, often of battles fiercely fought on land and water. And here are the two from the Florentine Codex. To represent these scenes, the Tlaquiloque mined the six books in the Historia devoted to warfare, and these are books five through 11 in the Olas Magnus Historia. Woodcuts here illustrate battlefield strategies and new weapons from cannons to muskets. A telling comparison can be made between the two clusters 
of the mounted horsemen in the lower right-hand corner, and I'm comparing these in the Florentine Codex with this group in the Olaus Magnus. This suggests that Sahagun's artists were keen to learn from the pictorial models in the Historia. To illustrate how some of the Florentine Codex paintings were adapted to meet the strategic needs of the Nawa stor storytellers, I explore two separate incidents in Book 12. My first example involves an unlikely pairing between the theme of the adoration of the Magi and a morality tale of indigenous traders. Chapters 25 and 26 in Book 12 describe the violent chaos that ensued during the Spaniards' escape from Tenochtitlan, the so-called Noche Triste that occurred on June 30th of 1520. At the top, we see the Spaniards using one of the causeways as an escape route to reach the mainland with the Mexica in hot pursuit. Like the battle scenes in the Magnus Historia, the Florentine Claquilo has divided his scene into horizontal registers. There are also parallels between some of the foot soldiers and the horsemen. And I'm thinking especially about this group of foot soldiers here and these foot soldiers, and of course the horsemen in the Florentine with the horseman in the Magnus. This is not verbatim mimesis, but details that may have inspired the Florentine artists. Moreover, the painter identifies Mexica costume elements and martial regalia. So this is where the Tlaquilo obviously is appropriating or claiming these warriors for themselves. Uh, for example, you see the maquahuitl here, the makana, or the obsidian bladed sword, uh, the shields, and this is a kopili headdress, which we will see again a little later on. After the disastrous Noche Triste, the tattered remnants of Cortez's contingent finally reached the mainland where they were greeted by peoples from Teocalhuayacan, who offered them safe passage to their community. The Altepetl of Teocalhuayacan was situated on the northwest side of Lake Texcoco. So here we have Teocalhuayacan, here are the, uh, the island capital of Tenochtitlan Tlatelolco, and uh, Teocalhuayacan was conquered under Itzcoatl. Uh, here's the toponym uh, for Teocalhuayacan, which means place of the tall temple. Teocalhuayacan had long submitted to the owner's tribute demands of the Mexica. Moreover, they were an Otomi community, and thus linguistically and culturally distinct from their Nahuatl-speaking neighbors. It is not surprising that the people of Teocalhuayacan begrudged Mexica oppression and received the Spaniards gladly. Their leaders addressed Cortez using courtly rhetoric. Quote, you are doubly welcome. May our lords, the gods, rest. They made the Spaniards very happy joining them peacefully, giving them deer fodder, water, shelled maize, tortillas. And uh, what I love here is the turkey under the arm of one of them, and the turkey eggs following shortly thereafter. Once in Teocalhuayacan, Cortez was again offered sustenance for his men and the horses. This redundant generosity was accompanied by a pledge of allegiance to the Spaniards. Capitalizing on the situation, the leaders of Teocalhuayacan aired their grievances about the bad treatment that they received under Motecuzoma. 
the Mexica they claimed were inhuman and, quote, afflicted us in extreme measure, end quote. Motecuzoma is visualized in the background. His presence, a rhetorical construct in their partisan agenda. Cortez then promises to destroy the Mexica as a retribution for this cruel treatment. The Teocalhuayacanos not only self-identify as Otomi, but underscore their kinship with the Tlaxcalans, the most potent of the Spanish indigenous allies. In the fierce realignment of micro-patriotic alliances generated by the war, the community of Teocalhuayacan is thus aiding and abetting the hated enemy of the Florentine authors. From the Mexica perspective, the Teocalhuayacanos are traitors. In the accompanying image, three of the emissaries from Teocalhuayacan approach Cortez in the submissive knee-bent positions that bear an uncanny resemblance to the figural arrangement of the adoration of the three magi. Elsewhere in the Florentine Codex, this familiar biblical scene provides the appropriate armature for scenes in books one and four, where offerings are being proffered to deity figures. So this is one of many, of course, adoration of the Magi scenes from an illustrated Bible. And here you have other scenes in the Florentine where I think the reference to the three Magi is pretty overt but they are making their offerings to a deity. The visual reference to the three magi in book 12, however, appears to have been mediated by a similar composition in book eight of the Olaus Magnus Historia. Note that one of the ambassadors is darkened. This is in the Historia. So I'm looking at the two figures with the red arrows. Suggestive of the wise man from Ethiopia. In a book devoted to good and bad governance, the woodcuts appear in chapter 34 titled, How to Detect and Be Wary of Traitors. The Magnus text warns that gift-giving gestures may only feign obedience. Signs of sinister duplicity are embedded in the image. The first envoy hides a sword behind his back. Serpents are either carried by others or emerge from vessels. There's a serpent here and another one poking its head out of a jar. Magnus cites Arabs and Africans as the most cunning of peoples, that is, those from another ethnicity or race. Others act out of their own self-interest, and we are also warned, induce neighbors to take up arms against the ruler. The comparison of the Historia woodcut with the Florentine image is striking. Cortez is seated on a chair that is similar in style to the throne of the Swedish king. And uh, Diana has spoken about this chair earlier this morning. It has many names. Uh, it's a folding chair, and it's called uh, either a silla de caderas, a silla de tijeras, an X chair, or a hip joint chair. Lori Deal refers to this imported folding chair as an icon of rule, signaling power. Both leaders hold a prominent staff of office and gesture to the three envoys. The Florentine Tlaquilo carefully selected an image of deceit and ethnic difference to impugn the Otomi of Teocalhuayacan, who proclaimed their allegiance to the Spaniards as vassals and took delight in the promise made by Cortez to seek retribution by defeating the Mexica. Thus, the Teocalhuayacanos are represented not just as malcontents, 
but also as disloyal and potentially dangerous, all under the guise of a hospitality of biblical proportions. My second example from Book 12 involves a hero, Tzila Katzin, who is also inspired by European models, but filtered through a Tlatelolco bias. The valiant deeds of Mexica warriors must have been recounted in oral, account, in oral recitations and song for decades before they were recorded in alphabetic script in 1555. The feats of indigenous heroes resonate with champions heralded in other cultural histories. For example, in the Magnus Historia, there's an entire book, book five, devoted to the giants. These intrepid, almost superhuman figures in the ancestral Nordic past performed feats of daring do that warranted their legendary status. In one chapter, a giant named Armgrim fights off parents, pirates as they are landing their craft on shore, armed only with a tree trunk rudder with which, in a single stroke, he, quote, battered to death all 12 of them, end quote. Of the several Mexica giants, one of the most celebrated in Book 12 is the resistance fighter Tzilakatzin, who is depicted at least six times. After the disastrous Noche Triste, the Spanish forces retrenched, then embarked on a naval attack of the island capital. The components of a dozen brigantines were constructed in Tlaxcala and assembled in Texcoco. This image in the Florentine on the left demonstrates how reliant the artists were on the many illustrations of brigantines found in the Magnus Historia. In both, we find the two masted ships are bristling with cannons. With their armed sailing ships, the Spaniards lay siege to Tenochtitlan and forced the Mexica to flee to Tlatelolco. Pedro de Alvarado leads a naval campaign to capture Tlatelolco, landing his brigantines at a place called Nonoalco. Although the indigenous forces are too fearful to mount a counterattack, Tzilakatzin is the exception, described as a great warrior and very valorous. On Folio 59V, Tzilakatzin looms larger than life. His aggressive stance and muscular body is in studied contrast with the diminutive European soldiers who struggle ashore, sheathed in armor and helmets. He alone confronts the Spaniards, throwing three huge round stones, or white stones, thus single-handedly scattering the foreign troops and inspiring his indigenous allies to join the battle. Tzilakatzin holds a stone in his raised arm, and another is already airborne on a deadly trajectory. The Tzilakatzin episode evokes tantalizing parallels with the well-known story of David and Goliath in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Goliath, the giant fighter, is selected by the Philistines to challenge any opponent from the Israelites. Everyone is dismayed and terrified of the giant, who is described as over nine feet in height with a bronze helmet on his head, wearing a coat of armor and carrying a javelin spear and a sword. The young shepherd boy, David, takes on the challenger, armed only with a sling and his faith in God. We are struck by the care with which the projectiles are numbered and described in each account. Tzilakatzin throws three round stones, and the biblical David chooses five smooth stones to put in his pouch. Then he kills Goliath with his first stone and brings the conflict to an end. 
Not surprisingly, the Nawa artist reverses the scale, inflating Tzilakatzin to loom large over the armored Spanish troops. Perhaps the memory of this image is what prompted Sahagun in his later 1585 revision of the conquest story that Manuel so uh, clearly or complicatedly <laughs> described for us. Um, in this revised version, done many years later, Sahagun refers to Tzilakatzin as a valiant Indian, quote, looking like another Goliath, end quote not a reference found in the earlier Florentine Codex. The David and Goliath story was clearly lurking behind both readings, but in the Florentine image, Tzila Katzin, like David, upholds the honor of an entire ethnic community. The Tlaquilo co-ops a Christian theme to fit his own agenda as he did with the adoration of the Magi. He makes explicit the high warrior rank of Tzilakatzin in his shorn hairstyle. He's described as being like a quauchik or a shorn one. His facial markings with the sort of cross hatching and a shield with a shopili design, which is that large teardrop design you also see in the back rack. The artist both marks the ethnicity of Tzilakatzin and firmly anchors his deed. Two toponyms are painted below Tzilakatzin's throwing arm to locate the action precisely at Nonoalco, or place of the overflowing salty water. So here you see the pot and the overflowing, which is comidal, the uh, locative at the end, ko and Ayaucaltitlan, um, or place of the oaks. You see the tree, the oak, on the locative tlantli, or tlan, uh, for teeth. Through these details of regalia and place, the Florentine Tlaquilo secures Tzilakatzin's role in history, fleshing out his identity and honorific rank to promote the truth value of the Nawa testimony. In our analysis of Book 12's imagery, we have noted that Euro-Christian models were transformed and deployed strategically with inventive combinations and inversions of meaning. Although some links are startlingly explicit, others are more suggestive paraphrases. These require us to track a chain of reference through mediating sources, like the Olaus Historia. These sly, intervisual relationships may only be echoes of the originals, but they are almost never empty derivations. More than likely, they provoke varied readings, as the Florentine Codex embraces multiple cultures. At the very least, in resituating the paintings within their textual and historic matrix, we complicate a Eurocentric understanding and foreground the intent of their indigenous makers. Thank you. Our next presentation is a collaboration between Kim Richter and Lisa Sosa. Kim Richter is Senior Research Spe Specialist in the Director's Office at the Getty Research Institute. She received her PhD in Art History at UCLA, specializing in pre-Columbian art and archaeology. She is author of numerous articles on Huastec art, co-editor of the Huasteca, Culture, History, and Interregional Exchange, co-author of Golden Kingdoms, Luxury and Legacy in the Americas. She is currently co-directing a new collaborative digital initiative focusing on the Florentine Codex. Lisa Sosa is a professor of history at Occidental College and an, an affiliated faculty of the Latina, Latino, and Latin American Studies program. 
She teaches courses on colonial and modern Latin American history, ethno-history, and histories of women, gender, and sexuality. She is the author of The Woman Who Turned Into a Jaguar and Other Narratives of Native Women in the Archives of Colonial Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Sosa as she presents the research conducted by both herself and Kim Richter in the roles of Nahua women in the Mesoamerican War and Conquest. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to begin um, this afternoon by thanking all of the organizers, all of the wonderful students, um, all of the uh, people who have put so much time and energy and creativity into bringing us together to study this important manuscript. And of course, I'd like to thank the uh, Florentine Codex Digital Initiative team that's involved me in this project. Um, so the title of the talk that Kim and I are doing focuses on the roles of Nawa women in Mesoamerican war and conquest. Whether heroes, villains, or vanquished, the main protagonists in histories of war are typically men. In the case of the Spanish conquest of Mexico, the story is no different. Historical narratives have centered on prominent Spaniards, such as Hernando Cortez, Pedro de Alvarado, and Bernal Diaz del Castillo, and indigenous leaders, including Moctezuma II and Cuauhtémoc, with one exception, Cortez's indigenous female interpreter, known in various sources as Malintzin, Malinche, or Doña Marina. But what about the many other women directly involved or affected by the war? What roles did they play? How, as women, did they have unique experiences of the conquest? Since the women who experienced the war were indigenous, it is not surprising that Spanish accounts provide scant evidence of their roles or the impact the conquest had on them. Similarly, in Nahua culture, war was the domain of men. So Nahua accounts likewise focus on the accomplishments of male leaders and warriors. However, a careful review of Spanish and Nahua historical texts provides insights into women's roles in the conflict. These sources are complemented by depictions of women in Nahua and Nahua Spanish pictorial manuscripts, key among them, Book 12 of the Florentine Codex. This presentation will highlight varied roles of women from slaves and victims of violence to healers, ritual specialists, and rebels. As a text co-authored by a Spanish friar and male Nahua writers and artists, it is not surprising that women seem to play a minor role in the narrative in Book 12. Of the 161 images, only 19 show women. Nine portray Malintzin, Cortez's interpreter, and 10 depict anonymous women. That Malintzin has an outsized representation compared to other women in this 16th century account would be expected given her pivotal role in exchanges between the Spaniards and Nawaz, though she too gets short shrift in later alphabetic and pictorial texts. And these are some of the many different images of Malintzin in the text. Our examination of Book 12 and other 16th century sources reveals the impact of the violence on women as well as their leadership roles that they assumed amid the chaos of war. Women are easily identified in Mesoamerican pictorial images. Nahua women are shown wearing their customary dress, a long shift or weepil over a wraparound skirt. They wear their hair loose if unmarried or pulled up and arranged in two top knots or horns if married. We can distinguish Malintzin from other women because she, clear, she nearly always appears at Cortez's side dressed in fine garments befitting her high status and she usually has speech scrolls coming out of her mouth and gestures with her hands both underscoring her critical role as an interpreter. 
Much has been written about complementary gender roles in Mesoamerican cosmology, ritual, and the division of labor. In a complementary system, men and women have distinct roles and responsibilities that are considered necessary for the well-being of their households and communities. In Nahua society, women's principal responsibilities were cooking, grinding corn, preparing beverages, spinning thread, and weaving. The Nahuatl term siwatekit, woman's work, referred to these duties. Commoner men worked as porters, builders, and farmers, and both noble and commoner men provided military service. Warfare, warfare was a symbol of masculinity. One text explains that a warrior hung the hair of an enemy who he had taken captive during the battle in his house, and that with it he called himself a man. These idealized binary gender roles are codified in bathing rituals described and depicted in the Florentine Codex and the Codex Mendoza, which show how gender norms were imposed on children from the moment of birth. Girls were given a broom, a spindle whirl, and weaving gear, and their umbilical cords were buried under the hearth. And you can see the women's gear here. Uh, boys, however, were given a bow and arrow and a shield and the insignia of their future trade, and their umbilical cords were buried on the battlefield. And that's depicted here. Here's also the boys' gear. Louise Burkhart has shown that the duties that women performed in the household had an impact on men's performance in the battlefield. Thus, gender roles were interdependent and complementary. Of course, these were idealized roles, and as we will see, women sometimes transgress these prescribed gender norms. Like men, indigenous women and children suffered in innumerable ways as a result of the conquest. Certain texts suggest that they were sometimes targeted for capture or attack, perhaps because they could be ransomed or enslaved by enemy groups. The Nawa authors of Book 12 recounted a particularly bitter episode of betrayal when the Xochimilca and other Chinampa people who had been the Mexica's allies pretended to help them, but then began to capture women and children. The Xochimilca immediately killed some of the captives and then placed others in boats to take them away. The accompanying image shows a Xochimilca warrior who snatches a woman and her child. The text adds that after a fierce battle, the Mexica recovered their captives, but they sought vengeance by annihilating the Xochimilca men, women, and children. All suffered in the war. In other images, we see women, sometimes alongside their husbands, carrying their children on their backs as they escape violence, battles, and destruction, or as they are taken as slaves. In the image on the right, for example, note the battle scene in the foreground, the burning house in the background, and the escaping family in the midst of this terrifying chaos. A similar image on the left shows a Nawa family fleeing Mexico Tenochtitlan after the final siege of the island and Cuauhtémoc's surrender. Although the war was officially over, the Spaniard lunging at them with his sword raised suggests the continuing threat and use of violence to terrorize the population. Indigenous women who accompanied Spaniards and native men on their conquering expeditions often lost their lives in battles. During the Noche Triste, a pivotal event um, when the Mexica and the Tlatelolca succeed in driving the Spaniards and their allies off of the island, many people were killed, and some of them even died by falling into the water and drowning. Once their enemies retreated, the Mexica moved all the dead bodies of Spaniards, Tlaxcalans, Sempoalans, and non-Mexica women to other parts of the lake. The Nahua authors state that they stripped the women, 
quote, stripped the women, which suggests that they were noble women who wore jewelry and elaborately woven textiles that were highly prized. Stripping the, the women may also have been an act to show disrespect as nudity was condemned in Mesoamerica and was sometimes used to shame those accused of sexual immorality. Several images and texts in Book 12 concerning women reveal the psychological toll of the war. When Motexoma realizes the Spaniards' bellicose nature and their intentions, he assembles some of the nobles to share his concerns. Both the men and women weep, showing their anxiety and concern about their fate. Or if we um, follow Rebecca's reading, expressing uh, susto, right? Uh, the idea of being terrified. The scene seems to foreshadow the loss of life, their homes, and their empire. Oh, let me just go back. The Nawa authors also recalled parents' expressions of deep despair when their sons, who had died as warriors, were retrieved from the battlefield, writing, quote, wailing arose from the mothers and fathers, crying and weeping over them. These scenes show, showing women alongside of men fleeing their homes, expressing their concerns about the future, and grieving the dead emphasize that as much as the war aimed to dismantle a political empire, it was also a war that uprooted and destroyed families. Because of their gender, women had unique experiences of the war and the political chaos that the Spanish invasion unleashed. unleashed. Indigenous leaders drew upon the pre-conquest precedent of using marriage to formalize political and military alliances by offering Spaniards their noble daughters as gifts. However, the Spaniards considered them their concubines or slaves, not wives, regardless of their noble status. Book 12 describes how the Tlaxcalans, the Spaniards' most important allies, quote, gave them their daughters, unquote. Kin makake imich pochwan. The text uses the word ipochtli, daughter, a term that designates a young unmarried woman. Since it was customary in Mesoamerica for young men and women to marry around the age of 15 or 16, it seems likely that these were very young teenage girls who were surrendered to the Spaniards. Once they were in Spanish hands, the captain of the expedition would distribute the young women to his top lieutenants. These young women were surely victims of rape by their Spanish husbands. Other Nahuatl language texts and images provide further evidence that sexual assault was used as a form of gendered violence to terrify local populations. And this is just um, from the uh, fragment of the Lienzo of Tlaxcala that's at the Benson Library at the University of Texas, Austin. And, oops, I'm sorry. Um, this is a group of women who are being presented to the Spaniards. A Florentine Codex artist conveys this sense of danger by showing the Spaniards lurking around women who work at their metates in preparation for the feast of Huitzilopochtli. The text explains, they passed among the grinding women, circling them, circling around them, looking at each one, looking upon their faces. In Nahua culture, to look someone in the eyes could carry a sexual connotation, and thus, in a speech in Book 6, a noble father warned his son that to look into the eyes of a married woman was to commit adultery. The father says, you are not to look at people. You are not to gaze into the eyes of people. You are not to stare. You are not to look into the face or to stare at one who is honored, especially at a woman. And finally, especially at someone's wife. For it is said that he who stares at, gazes into the eyes of another's wife, commits adultery. Perhaps the Spaniards intended to provoke the men to war by threatening to assault the women. As the text explains, quote, it later became known, according to what is said, that they would have killed 
people at the time if many of the men had congregated. So it is clear with that kind of secondary comment that there was some sort of tension um, and threat implied. This episode suggest, suggests that the threat of rape and violence may have been used to intimidate and subjugate both the, me, the women and men. Another mid-16th century Nahuatl language text, the Annales of Tlatelolco, further testifies to the violation of women as they fled the island following the Mexica and Tlatelolco's surrender to the Spaniards. Quote, the Christians searched all over the women they pulled down their skirts and went all over their bodies, in their mouths, on their abdomens, in their hair. The Nawa authors of the Florentine Codex had similar memories of abuse when they reco recalled that, quote, along every stretch of the road, the Spaniards took things from people by force. They were looking for gold. They cared nothing for greenstone, precious feathers, or turquoise. They looked everywhere with the women, on their abdomens, under their skirts." End quote. Both the Annales of Tlatelolco and the Florentine Codex use the Nahuatl term shilan, which James Lockhart notes in his translation referred to abdomen, belly, or womb. And thus, according to Lockhart, the authors may have intended that the Spaniards looked everywhere with the women in their vaginas, under their skirts. Clearly, the Nahuatl language text condemned the Spaniards violating the, the women's bodies as they attempted to flee for their lives. In addition, the Nahuatl authors of Book 12 recalled that the Spaniards, quote, took, picked out the beautiful women with yellow bodies, end quote. The women, however, were not passive victims. They eluded the Spaniards by assuming a wretched state, quote, and how some women got loose was that they covered their faces with mud and put on ragged blouses and skirts, clothing themselves all in rags." End quote. As we will see, this spirit of resistance emerges in other parts of the text. Alongside of the portrayal of women as victims of the upheaval and violence of the conquest, Book 12 also depicts Nahua women in prominent roles as interpreters, ritual specialists, and healers. We will hear more about Malintzin's um, role tomorrow in Mary Miller's presentation. Suffice it to say here that she played a critical diplomatic role as Cortez's interpreter. It is worth noting that in her study of representations of Malintzin, Jeanette Peterson shows how indigenous pictorials portray her as a protagonist, a woman warrior, and a goddess. The authors and artists of the Florentine Codex clearly recognized her as a leader and a central figure of the conquest drama. Let us reconsider the image of the women at their metates in the uh, temple patio. The two temple women grind amaranth to make a special dough used to form the image of the Mexica's principal deity, Huitzilopochtli, for the Toshkot festival. They also likely would have made foods for the feast and as sacred offerings. The Nahua authors recalled that the women, quote, had fasted for a year, unquote, a phrase that means that they had eaten only fasting foods and that they had abstained from sex. Thus, it seems they were priestesses or women who had taken a special vow to serve in the Templo Mayor and therefore had a central role in Nawa ritual life. The image of a female healer or Tisi further attests to women's leadership roles amidst the chaos of the conquest. She tends to men and women stricken by the first smallpox epidemic to sweep central Mexico in 1520. In Nahua society, female healers were recognized for their skill and expertise. For example, in a speech recorded in book six of the Florentine Codex, the expectant woman and her family use words that are reserved for elite artisans and craftspersons to address the tea seat. Um, and I've just listed all of the different terms that I found um, in, in book six uh, that correspond to that. 
Um, interestingly, they also associate her with the sacred and the ancestral worlds by referring to her with a variety of terms such as precious lady lord, noble woman, sacred mother, and our progenitress. The Nahuatl language text in book 12 describes the enormous suffering. Quote, large bumps spread on people. Some were entirely covered. They spread everywhere, on the face, the head, the chest, etc. The, the disease brought great desolation. A great many died of it. They could no longer walk about, but lay in their dwellings and sleeping places, no longer able to move or stir. The speech scroll in front of the tea seat's mouth shows that she consoles these those whose bodies are ravaged by pustules, or perhaps she recites a healing incantation. Most of the smallpox victims lie motionless, but the speech scroll in front of one of the patients corresponds to the statement in the text, quote, when they made a motion, they called out loudly, unquote. Thus, the image reveals the valiant efforts of female healers to care for the suffering. Indigenous sources further reveal how, in the face of crisis, women emerged as leaders, informants, and warriors. An image from Book 12 shows a woman carrying her water jug, or holding her water jug, and shouting to the Mexica that the Spaniards are making a hasty retreat. This is just one of many examples that sheds light on women mobilizing to confront the Spaniards and their allies at various stages of the war. The woman's multiple speech scrolls emphasize that she calls out repeatedly, or maybe loudly, urging the Mexica to pursue the Spaniards and their allies. According, according to the narrative, she shouted, quote, oh Mexica, come running. Your enemies have come out. They have emerged secretly, end quote. In her chant sighting, she becomes a capitana, directing the warriors to mobilize. Similarly, Women confronted the Spaniards after they set fire to the temples in the sacred precinct. And quote, one woman came to very close quarters with our enemies, throwing water at them, throwing water in their faces, making it stream down their faces, end quote. According to the Annals of Tlatelolco, Tlatelolcan women battled the Spaniards and their allies when the Mexica abandoned the fight and let the southern portion of the island fall into Spanish hands. By the time the fighting reached the great marketplace, the Tlatelolcan warriors were, quote, entirely vanquished, end quote. But the women refused to surrender. The narrative recounts, quote, that was when the Tlatelolca women all let loose, fighting, striking people, taking captives, they put on warrior's devices, all raising their skirts so that they could give pursuit, unquote. The Tlatelolcan authors simultaneously emasculate the Mexica warriors by portraying them as cowards and elevate the role of the Tlatelolcan women in the final attempts to save the island from the Spaniards. As a brief epilogue, let me add that these spontaneous interventions during times of crisis recorded in Nahuatl language texts resemble women's physical engagement and stubborn resistance in riots of the colonial period. In his study of colonial uprisings in central Mexico and Oaxaca, William Taylor found that women led 25% of all rebellions and, per and participated in virtually all of them. There were many uprisings throughout the 16th century in Mexico as Mexica nobles and commoners, men and women, objected to the Spaniards' excessive demands for tribute and labor that had been imposed in the wake of the conquest. As but one of many examples from the time the Nahua authors and Sahagun were collaborating on, collaborating on the Florentine Codex, uh, let me just offer the uh, account of Chimal Pahin, a prolific Nawa writer. He wrote in 1564, quote, the Mexica, the men and the women stoned the Tecpan of San Juan because they did not consent to pay the tribute. They went about very angry and they strongly protested. 
Although book 12 is about men, be they Spanish or indigenous, and their heroic and not so heroic deeds, it also provides a glimpse on the experiences of women in the conquest of Mexico. All indigenous people, men and women, would have suffered social upheaval, exile from their homes, and political chaos. They would have witnessed horrific violence and unprecedented death due to disease and warfare. But women, by virtue of their gender, also had unique experiences of war. Many, like Malintzin, were given or taken, depending on the author's perspectives, as brides, slaves, or captives. Some women worked as healers to care for those who fell ill, and they sought to maintain relations with the deities as ritual leaders. Many women struggled to protect and provide for their children and families, often in the absence of their husbands. And as the situation became increasingly desperate, they fought valiantly alongside men to defend their home and their altepet. They continued to do so in the colonial period. They continue to do so today. <laughs>